Well, thank you so very much for spending part of your Saturday with us here to talk about trash. And really, I think about this whole thing as part of the context of our entire time in the 21st century where we are facing a series of existential crises that are accumulating. I mean, you cannot open the newspaper or even hear anything without finding a tremendous amount of things to be concerned about. So what I want to do today is put the whole thing a little bit in perspective, talk a bit about the problem indeed, but I'd like to spend some time looking at how we can approach solutions because we need to start rethinking some of the things that we have taken for granted so that we can begin to move forward. And it is going to take all of us. We cannot assume complacency in this battle. This didn't happen overnight. It happened over a period of about 50 years. But hopefully, it won't take 50 more to undo the damage. So are we OK? And hopefully, it won't take me 50 years to get this <laughs> Um, okay, so I like to start by reminding us that we are all human animals and that we depend on the life support system of our Earth for everything we need. The critical things that we can't do without are fresh air, clean water, fertile ground, and all of the other species with whom we share the planet. You think about all the stuff that we have, all the things that we consider essential, None of those are life and death essential, the way air, water, and fertile land are. And you think about how we take advantage and take for granted those very things that are our life support system and how we're having them under attack. So I think about the things that are assaulting our life support system, and it really is the fossil fuel combustion, which is affecting the atmosphere and the stability of our climate. It is the hyperconsumption, where we have become users of things. Ah, good. So we can go down and catch up. Uh, and you look at the, the growing population of, of all of the people on the Earth expecting to have a consumption pattern that's increasing, and the resource extraction that exceeds the replacement value. So this year, the United States passed the replacement value of the resources we used. What month do you think? March of this year, the United States passed our resource replacement value. August 1st of this year, the entire globe passed its resource base. Now you think about that. Only 20 years ago, that replacement date was December for the globe. And for the US, it was July. So not only are we going the wrong direction, we are going there more and more rapidly. So that's the problem. Sorry, that, that we have an existential crisis, both from climate change, from the combustion and the, you know, ex, the greenhouse gas accumulation, but also from the global pollution, and most particularly global pollution from man-made materials like plastics, which has now become ubiquitous on Earth. It has entered our food chain. It has entered the food chains of all of the systems of the Earth. You can't escape it no matter where you are. And if sustainability is our goal, that means that you balance the economy, the environment, and the societal values of our culture. Right now, if you had to draw that picture to be reality, the economic circle would obliterate everything else. We only measure dollars. And that means that you discount what it is that makes us human in our culture, in our societal values, our philosophies, our religions, our humanity and it discounts our life support system, which is the natural environment. So we need to work to get that balance back in line so that we have a way to sustain our entire civilization going forward. And the concept of sustainability has been debated. I belong to an association where we have long academic arguments about what sustainability means. I still like to go back to the one from the Brundtland Commission in 1985. 
I have a little granddaughter who is only now 12, and I care a great deal about her future. And she's learning, this was her first loaf of bread um, that she made by herself. And she called me up all excited to tell me, Mimi, I made a loaf of bread all by myself. And it took me all afternoon, and the boys ate it in 15 minutes. <laughs> But she had the satisfaction of providing for her family. And I think about what it takes for us all to provide for our families and how we need to think about our children and their expectations for their children and what kind of a world and a legacy we're leaving to them. And that, I think, is a critical thing. The issues that we're facing, these global existential issues, are not technology problems at all. They are ethics problems. They are moral choices. They are decisions that we make every day to favor convenience and profit and instant gratification at the expense of our children's future. These are not accidents. They are deliberate decisions that we make as a, as a culture, as a community, as people. And they have consequences that we will not bear, but that our children will. So I like to think about looking at system solutions to system problems. And they come in three categories. One is the energy system, the second is our material system, and the third is regenerative agriculture. And I'm going to talk today mostly about the green chemistry side of our problem, because you wanted to focus on plastics and focus on solutions, and that is where I think we find them. The other two parts you can find in my book, which I'd be happy to you know, make available to you a little bit later. Um, you look at the problem of global pollution from plastics, it's really an economic issue where we're taking raw material, mostly of fossil origin, and turning it to trash as fast as possible because it's the transaction and the sale of the product that generates something that you value as a profit. The second one is an environmental and health issue where you're accumulating non-biodegradable and toxic materials in the biosphere. And the third one is, again, the ethics issue, where the right of living things to exist is being compromised by the way we have been using materials. So the unintended consequence of all this convenience is really pretty absurd if you think about it. You know, you think about where we get plastic. It really comes from natural gas and petroleum mostly. It used to come from coal as well. And you have to then refine and distill, ship it to uh, a treatment place, make it into a factory where you shape it appropriately into usable things, take it to a store, the entire retail apparatus that goes on. Sorry, I keep banging into your microphone. Um, and then we think that that is convenient because you use it once and throw it away instead of just washing your fork. I mean, think about all the things that we have taken into our households as normal um, materials that you use once and throw away. I leave it to you to make the list. <clears throat> and is it convenience or is it really something else? Is it really something else? Have we gotten to the point where we take it for granted that when you throw something away, somebody else will deal with it and that it goes away? This is the picture of the uh, concert where they left 48 tons of debris after the concert in the parking lots around PNC Park. And it caused an, a ruckus and an uproar, and they made some requirements that you put a deposit on the use of the space to allow for the cleanup. What about saying, if you bring it, you take it away? Where is your sense of responsibility for what you use? The whole concept of responsibility has been obliterated by this sense that you have unfettered freedom to do whatever you please. And you can insert whatever expletive you like. Um, but I think that is the problem. We fail to take responsibility for our own actions, and we presume that it's somebody else's job to clean up the mess. That is not a technology problem. And plastic has now 
become part of everything. We discard 33.6 million tons of plastic a year, and only about 6.5% of it is recycled. About 7%, give or take a bit, is incinerated or burned into an energy facility. China no longer will accept our trash because it's too contaminated. Our average recycled material is 4 to 5 percent contaminated with non-recyclable material, including food residue that we don't bother washing out of the containers we throw away. I mean, it's just laziness, okay? You figure, oh, this is garbage, we throw it away, and somebody else will deal with it. And it is mostly now going to landfills. And landfills are not just dumps anymore. They're engineered, um, compacted. That stuff will be there for a long, long, long time because it's retained by the pressure. There's no water in it. If you're lucky, you haven't contaminated it. They have water siphoned out and treated so that you really never get rid of it. It will become the archaeological find of future creatures who will study our you know, culture and our civilization. And unfortunately, most of the plastics are made with things that have endocrine disrupting properties. There are about 80,000 chemicals in commercial use today, commonly, and only about 200 of them have been tested deliberately for health effects. Common consumer products contain phthalates, parabens, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are fire retardants, PCBs, which are still with us, even though they were banned in the 70s. They were insulating materials for electronics. If you really want to go in detail into the um, kinds of plastics there are, you can look at the work of Arlene Bloom um, or at Linda Birnbaum, who is at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. And her, their work has a tremendous amount of information about that. But these things are, you know, on the labels. And we have been looking at trends in epidemiology that show you increases in testicular cancer, in breast cancer, in um, malformations of the genitalia, and of sperm count decline. And the sperm count decline is even more acute in Europe than in the US, but it is definitely in a trend that has gone on a downward spiral. I think these are things that are concerning, but you have a tremendous problem with the regulatory apparatus because the burden of proof rests on the consumer. It is very difficult to do human studies by epidemiology because you can't do a controlled experiment where these people are not treated and these people are exposed. We're not rats, we're not you know, colonies of cells, we have choice. And animal models are open to question because we're not rats, we're not mice, we're not, you know, Ephestia or Drosophila, so you can't say that things that were done in animal models are directly transferable to people. And the industry will argue that. You can't prove that my chemical made you sick because you're exposed to a stew of chemicals, you're bathed on a daily basis with hundreds and hundreds of chemicals. Uh, studies have shown, both from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and from the Environmental Working Group and many others, that at birth, a newborn child has over 200 chemicals in their body at birth. And 75 of them are known to be mutagens and carcinogens. So, we are pre-polluting our children, and that is because these plastic chemicals have gotten into the food chain, and you take them in whether you intend to or not. And it is a regulatory quagmire. You see every day now the EPA is rescinding things like banning neonicotinoids that were approved before. Uh, the regulatory process has been cut into a halt. Even the limited protections that we've managed to establish are under challenge and under attack. And the problem is that, you know, when things get into the food chain, they're magnified as they go up. And unless you're a vegetarian, you're pretty much at the top of the food chain. So one of the things that can help 
is if you eat less meat, less processed food, and try to eliminate these things as much as you can um, from your environment. But it's very, very difficult. Um, and these, these materials are made in large quantities. I mean, you, you have massive amounts. Of, I'm hearing clicking. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> the ubiquitous camera. <laughs> um, so you have um, a lot of unknown effects of the combined you know, action of these things that you're taking in uh, without even deliberately knowing. So the solutions of this require that we move from being aware of it to taking action. And that means we have to restructure the value system and look at ways to prevent these kinds of harms from being incorporated into things that we use every day. And we have to respect the precaution of protecting living systems. So we'll talk about that now. First of all, we're using fossil-based feedstocks. And most of the cost of that has been heavily subsidized by the government. You don't really see the fact that access to mining rights and mineral rights having supremacy over surface rights are really part of the subsidy of fossil fuels. Um, you know, when you are looking at fracking in many communities, you have this argument about the owners of what is under the ground can say especially in our state where Act 13 gives them access whether the surface owners want to or not. You are required to be accessible to those rights of minerals that are under your land. Well, I've been digging about this because I think it's so wrong since the life support system of the ecosystems are all on the surface. The wetlands, the freshwater, the forests, all the things that create the things that we need are on the surface of the land. So it turns out there's an 1837 law that granted access for mining to federal lands because of public convenience and necessity for mining coal to drive the Industrial Revolution. That has remained part of our land use policy going forward all this time. It's still there now. But the public convenience and necessity has changed. First of all, necessity for mined oil, gas, and coal has been supplanted by other resources, both wind resources, solar resources, and bio-based resources, things that can be replenished if managed well. So the necessity is long gone. And the convenience issue, well, to whom is it convenient to dig up the ground, to blow up the tops of the mountains, to completely destroy our wildlife refuges in the interest of short-term profits for a few multinational corporations? It's just topsy-turvy backwards. So I think one of the things we can begin to look at is to re-establish the public convenience and necessity definition as preserving our life support system instead of our extractive resource system. This is a fundamental change in the way we have organized our economy. And this is not something that requires a great deal of work. It requires a change in the law to bring it up to date for modern time. Now, obviously, with the current Congress having 50% of its members not believing that this is an issue or a problem and having a vested interest in this continuing, that is the crux of the problem. Therefore, you know what we need to do, right? <laughs> and the other part of the problem is that the true costs are not reflected in the price that people pay because you do not see embedded in that plastic bottle that you buy, you know, three or five for, you know, they're, they're cheap, relatively cheap to buy water in a bottle. But it doesn't reflect all of that supply chain of making that plastic bottle and putting the water into it and shipping it somewhere on a truck, none of that cost is really reflected. And when you get to the point where this is now garbage, who's going to pay for that? Okay, You're going to have to pay now to throw it away? No, you don't. You put it in the trash and it goes away. Excuse me. We need to rethink that. 
And this little graph shows you the acceleration of our production of plastics. And you can see that starting in about 1957, it just started going up and up and up. So this is when the, you know, better living through chemistry, the, you know, everything to be convenient um, came into place. And you can trace it to the change from munitions development during the Second World War to now making something for domestic use. And what they did was shift all that production capability that we ramped up very quickly for the Second World War from making munitions to making fertilizer, pesticides, herbicides, and plastic. And that is why that curve has gone up like that. So it has a very short, very intentional policy decision that drove it, and it's going to take a policy implementation decision to send it the other way. So how do you do that? Instead of going from raw material to trash and making that the value proposition, you have to, took, to take the value proposition into a circular direction so that you have the consumption and use, instead of going to trash, have it be recycled and reused and have the manufacturing designed so that you do plan to recycle and reuse as opposed to throw away. So you have a whole third of that circle which is not currently part of our economic proposition. We do the manufacturing starting from raw materials and we go to trash and we have not incorporated into our economy that whole third of a circle that gives you the design for the purpose of reusing materials. And if you can eliminate the single-use products on purpose, it will reduce the hyperconsumption considerably. The other thing is the ecosystem services here, these are the things that provide our life support system. The you know, nutrient cycle, the you know, food production, fiber production, all of the things that you know, regulate the climate, um, all of the things that do flood protection and wetland protection, all of our aesthetic and cultural attributes that we get from the natural world, these things are not counted in the gross domestic product, which is that little shaded um, dark area. The gross domestic product is about $18 billion, $18 trillion, I'm sorry. The ecosystem services that do not count which we use but do not value, are $33 trillion. So it is more of our value system. And you think about it, for fracking, for example, they take water out of the river and out of the streams. They don't pay for that water, okay? And they don't pay to clean up what they damage in the wetlands. And when you have coal companies, for years and years, they extracted minerals from the ground and they made a profit and now communities like ours are facing erosion of our sewer systems from acid mine drainage, from mines we didn't even have on the map. Okay, nobody's gonna pay for that. Every community in this state is facing acid mine drainage and wetland damage, and we have nowhere to go for recourse because the profiteers have long gone, and they're not here, there's no one to hold accountable. Again, anyone has a diligent law student, I would love to track down who are the legacy owners of all those mines and see if we can take them to court, although who knows how that would work. But the main thing to remember is that the things that are our life support system are not counted in our value proposition. They're taken for granted and they are considered free, but they're not free. So secondly, We'll move to green chemistry as a possible source of solution. Now, green chemistry presumes that you design things to be non-toxic on purpose. You test to be sure that the processes and the products that you make are not biohazards in, the, in their use. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, and 
it presumes that you reduce the hazard rather than the level of exposure. Right now, the burden is on the consumer to try to avoid all of these ingredients. If you go to the environmental working group, you'll find tables and tables and charts of you know, what you should watch for on the label and what you don't buy and how you avoid it. I mean, you drive yourself crazy and you have to carry a microphone, uh, I mean a, mic a magnifying glass to read them because the labels are written by lawyers for other lawyers and not for people to actually understand anything, right? So you can go crazy trying to track this stuff. But if you look at what causes risk, it's a function of the hazard and the exposure. And our entire regulatory system says, well, if we can just limit the amount of exposure and titrate down how much is actually exposed to the public to limit little tiny bits, it'll be OK. But the problem is some of this stuff is cumulative. And the problem is some of this stuff comes out in massive amounts. So that even under regulation, 5.2 billion pounds per year of toxics are released legally by existing permits. And that doesn't include the things that are released illegally uh, in violation of permits, which we all know about from our delightful joys of trying to clean up the air in Pittsburgh. So the whole system is flawed because it's designed to titrate down, you know, okay, we're going to ratchet down how much you're allowed to emit. The industry argues that that's too expensive and you end up somewhere in the middle and you still end up releasing lots and lots and lots of toxic material. So if instead, and I'm not going to read all these to you, you follow green chemistry principles, then you reduce the inherent hazard of the material. You reduce the toxicity or eliminate it to the extent possible instead of saying, oh, really, we should only allow you to have this much exposure to benzene or tetracycline or whatever it is that you're producing, you say, wait a minute, can't we make materials that don't require you to use toxic stuff and that are safe so that you don't have to worry about contaminating everybody when you're doing it? Now, I'm going to read to you a little piece because Janine Benyus says this better than I ever could. One of the ways to do this is to look at nature as a biomimicry process. And Janine Benyus, take this off. No, I'm okay. Nature manufactures its materials under life-friendly conditions, in water, at room temperature, without harsh chemicals or high pressures. Despite what we would call limits, nature manages to craft materials of a complexity and functionality that we can only envy. Now, she is really one of the chief proponents of biomimicry as a solution, but we have a number of them in Pittsburgh. One of them is Eric Beckman, who is at the University of Pittsburgh, and he has invented something called tissue glue, and it was derived from studying barnacles. Okay, any of you know about barnacles, if you have a boat, okay? How easy are they to get off of whatever you've got them stuck on, okay? And they withstand salt water and storms and your chisel and your fingernails and you go crazy trying to get them off. Well, the adhesive that barnacles use to attach to surfaces was researched and made in the lab so that you can use it during surgery, especially internal gastric surgery where the tissues are frail and tend to tear under stitching and cause a lot of morbidity to the patient, they have developed a way to mimic that glue that mollusks use to attach to rocks and boats and other things. And it is one of those kinds of things that instead of all this filament and plastic wire and so forth, you can now use sort of as a, a adhesive for surgical purposes. So this is one example. There are many, many, many more. But I think this is the kind of imaginative solution that we can start looking at. Another one is Terry Collins at CMU in the Institute for Green Science has been worried about the fact that our drinking water supplies are increasingly being contaminated with things that are not taken out by the water treatment process chlorination for killing bacteria, 
filtration for eliminating debris does not get soluble organic compounds like phthalates, like birth control pills and Prozac out of your drinking water. And they're beginning to find detectable levels in the finished product now because we've got some contamination in our rivers and in our water supplies that we can't get it out. Now, it isn't to the point where the entire population is being sedated by Prozac. But you are finding feminization of fishes in places that have sewer outfalls in them, and that was shown by Dr. Dan Voltz um, in the Allegheny River, where they did a study of the fishes in the Allegheny River and found endocrine disruption evidence most acutely, not in the plume of the power plants where they were looking for it, but in the outfalls of the sewers that emptied into the river. So this is the kind of thing where a catalyst has been developed that can be used and recovered from the water treatment process that will basically destroy organic contaminants to drinking water. Again, a green chemistry solution to a problem that we have caused by our profligate use and wanton waste of things that are not designed to be biodegradable. And then there's the whole business of making things like pharmaceuticals, like food additives, like all kinds of things that you eat, and they use petrochemical solvents. Well, you end up with contaminants from the petrochemical solvents that stay in the end product. Now, we have here Lalit Cordia, also in Pittsburgh, from Tar Industries. Very inventive and creative gentleman, now working on purification of water. Um, but he uses liquefied carbon dioxide as a synthesis medium. And it has the advantage of not leaving residues in his products. He has um, been doing mostly also plant-based instead of petroleum-based feedstocks. He is very uh, adamant about using uh, only plant-based materials in his work. And here again, the whole result has been something that gives you a less toxic end result. And he has just recently been acquired by a company in Germany to make this into a, a mass production. So another one is to use plant-based plastics instead of petroleum-based plastics. I'm not going to go through all of this in detail in the interest of time, but you can use biological precursors and polymerize them into things that basically are like plastics, but they're biodegradable and non-toxic. And there are a lot of these that can do that. You can grow algae. You can use enzymes to synthesize things. You can use hemp as a source of fiber and, and products for polymerization. There are a lot of emerging innovations in this kind of material science. And you make things green by design. Therefore, you end up with products that are biodegradable and non-toxic and non-hazardous by design. I think this is the direction for the future. And this is where we need to spend our time and attention. Most of this stuff is underfunded or illegal in some cases. Uh, much of it is competitive in other countries. Germany invests heavily in this kind of research and also China. Um, we are at one time have been the leaders in these kinds of innovations but have become uh, limited and uh, uh, harnessed by some of the current practices. The third area that we need to focus on is taking precaution in protecting living systems. One of the things that I find completely distressing is that things that are convenient, that you use once and throw away, have a life in the landfill or in wherever you send them of hundreds of years, hundreds. The plastic you know, cups that you use, the little lids on your Starbucks thing, the one I just had delivered to me, it will last 80 years. Fishing line, 600 years. You know, plastic bottles, 400 years. So you do not, for the convenience of a moment, actually have something that is degradable in a moment. You have something that will last for a long time. Plastic bags, 200 years. So you have to think about this. Is this convenience worth the burden 
of generations. Our whole country is only a little over 200 years old. How are we going to have our children enjoying a world that we have left with all of this debris of our own making? And I think the whole system of approach to new materials is backwards. We test for health effects only when consumers complain or sue or, or provide some incontrovertible evidence, like Monsanto is being sued right now by some 4,000 people who are claiming health effects, many of them workers in farm fields where they were exposed to chemicals um, by their work, um, are now one at a time, one at a time, going through the courts. And just as the tobacco industry argued, you can't prove that my tobacco made you sick, it's really good for you. These guys are saying, you can't grow crops without our stuff, and you can't prove that we made you sick. Well, 4,000 cases worth, we might actually get through to these people, but it's going to take a lot of work. But the burden of proof has to be shifted to the manufacturer. The burden of proof is currently on the consumer, and we have allowed it to be placed there by being complacent in allowing the law to protect the polluter and not the citizen. We don't protect our workers. The average worker in a factory that makes bisphenol A containing products has 1,000 times the level of bisphenol A in their bodies as individuals in the general public. 93% of us have bisphenol A in our bodies at any given time, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. If you get a receipt that's a thermal printed receipt, there's bisphenol A in that ink, okay? If you're a retail person working for minimum wage or less and you're handing receipts out to people all day, your occupational exposure to bisphenol A is just through the roof because it's absorbed through your skin. So we have to start thinking about what we're doing. This stuff is an endocrine disruptor and your children, and your children's children, if you're a woman, will carry the results of that exposure. You need to have independent validation of the non-toxicity or non-hazard of materials before they go into public use. Why is that a revolutionary statement? Okay, this should be normal. You know, if you call Senator Toomey, he won't agree. I've tried. You should hear his opinion on Monsanto. Okay, so one of the things you can do to begin this is to refuse to take things. When you go to a restaurant, just say to them when you sit down, I don't want a plastic straw. I don't want styrofoam takeaway containers. Begin to think in advance, oh, I'm going shopping. I should bring a bag with me. Oh, I'm going to be eating out at a place like a picnic. I should bring my cutlery with me. It isn't that hard. Diane can give you all kinds of help with this. Um, but you have to have the thought in your mind. There is a website called myplasticfreelife.com, which gives you hundreds of examples and ideas for how you can get back down that curve, okay? But what do you do with the people in the grocery store who are now putting everything in these little clear plastic clamshells? Okay, now, this is the ultimate product of the cracker plant that's going up in Manaka. Poly clear plastic for packaging stuff. Oh, it's so easy. You buy stacks of them and you just put everything in there and you throw them away. Okay, go to the produce manager and say, I would love to buy this, but I don't want the plastic shell. You either have your own container or you have a little bag. They look at you, first of all, like you're completely crazy. Um, and then you begin talking to them in a little more vociferous manner, and you're now gathering a crowd. And street theater is a very effective way. I know this isn't for everybody, but believe me, it can be very effective. Um, you have to begin demanding. And you go to buy something like an eggplant. Please, somebody tell me, why is it shrink-wrapped to the point that the poor thing is wilting? I present this to the produce manager and say, you know, sir, I would love to buy this lovely eggplant, 
but I don't want it squished in plastic first. Oh, well, it extends the shelf life. I said, well, not if nobody buys it, it won't. I'm not buying any of this stuff. You turn around and exit dramatically, okay? <laughs> I mean, it, it is a little bit. It's not for everybody, but it's what I do. And it does help sometimes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really frustrating when you are finding yourself confronted with layers and layers and layers of packaging that are supposed to help the security of the product or some other convenience for the retailer that is not really in the consumer's interest and doesn't really help. So we have to start taking that really sharp curve back down. And one of the ways you do it is by calling up the producer and saying, why are you selling me stuff in 15 layers of plastic when it's like this big and doesn't really need a bag? Give me a break already. You know, you have to start demanding of the people who are providing these things that they respond to the overwhelming global issue of inundation with useless material, useless, expensive, world-killing material. It isn't convenient. It's killing us. So you know about food waste. We have 40% of what comes out of the ground ends up in the trash. There are lots and lots of things you can do about that yourself. Um, and I, I would love to talk about it some more, but we're going to try to curtail this a bit. And you can deliberately seek out things that are made from recycled material. Um, there are flooring products that are designed uh, from reused materials and are designed also to be reused. There are wrapping papers and shelf liners and floor coverings. If you look at the supply and look at where they came from, you can make choices that even if things are plastic, they may be made from reclaimed material. And you have to recycle collect correctly. If we're gonna be able to recycle at all, that 1% purity of the product is going to apply to whatever American recycling process emerges. You're not going to be able to just throw everything into the mixed recycle trash bin with the ketchup still in it and the Chinese takeout still in it and mixing things that are recyclable with stuff that aren't. Um, and if the people who live in your house are oblivious, you know, you need to get nasty and instruct them. I go around and around about this. Pizza boxes saturated with grease are not recyclable, sorry. And the, the rules are different with different communities depending on who your trash management company is. So find out what the rules are and abide by them. And you need to use your voice. Um, ask for less products. We have to support laws that will help reduce this problem. Uh, some communities have begun doing bans on plastic. Um, you can visit your retailers, your restaurants, and ask them to not provide single-use products and make it clear that you support them if they don't. Um, and there are some that are deliberately using reclaimed plastic. You should make sure that they know that you appreciate that. And remember, this is a moral imperative. Freedom without responsibility yields chaos. And I contend that we're close to chaos right now. That technology that's used without accountability and wisdom will yield disaster. The unintended consequences of convenience are upon us. And we have to start applying that little judgment call that just because we can do something doesn't mean that we should. Rachel Carson advised that to the Women's Garden Club back in 1962. And I think that was just shortly before she died. It was one of her last speeches. And she was talking about the pollution of our planet and what we might do about it. You have to think. You have to think. And we need a new system of economics that replaces that linear gross domestic product with a circular dynamic equilibrium. And this is the sign that many of us have marched behind. It's really that that boils it all down, okay? Our life support system is more valuable than any amount of money. And we have to demand that the life support system that we all depend on counts in what matters in our communities. And we need to look again at our common 
vested interest in the living earth. The public trust doctrine of natural resource management is well established and well known. Um, I teach it, many other people in town teach it. If you know the tragedy of the commons written about by Paul Ehrlich years ago, we are living it right now on a global scale. We need to manage the critical common resources for the long-term benefit of all of us and get away from this, I got mine, you guys can all go jump off a cliff. You have to go to thinking about what the next generation needs and what our obligations are. And we have to retain our sense of wonder at the beautiful world that is possible. The world that we live in, we're in Pittsburgh. We have a biophilic city. We have all kinds of things to rejoice. Um, and I take strength from that myself. This is a gray hair streak that was in my own garden for a few days um, on the mint, which has gone to seed. Um, but Rachel Carson had it right. You know, that those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. That is what keeps me together right now. And I think connecting to the natural world keeps us together. So I thank you for your attention. Sorry, I went a little bit over.